Thank you very much. You know, uh, over the years, I've had and heard that song sung by others. And, you know, honestly, it's not the same. This man just sings it in a way that nobody else can sing that particular song. And it's become so popular, like in some circles, the most popular song of its, of its kind. And I just want to thank Lee. He's been with us from the beginning. Uh, really a talented, unique guy and a good person with a great family. So thank you very much, Lee. We appreciate it very much. And a very special hello to North Carolina. We love North Carolina. I don't know if I don't know if my boy told you, but Laura and Eric have two beautiful children. One of them happens to be named Carolina. So, so uh, that's pretty good. That's that means you like the place pretty much, huh? So it's great. But it's also great to be back in this uh, incredible state with so many proud American patriots who believe in faith and family, God and country. Thank you very much. We need more of that in this nation, don't we? We need more of that. It'd be a much different place right now because right now it's not doing well. Right now we're a failing nation, but we will soon be a great nation again. Earlier today, I visited western North Carolina and witnessed the terrible devastation from Hurricane Helene. I was actually here about a week and a half ago, right after, but I didn't want to come into certain sections because I wanted to let them do their job. And our federal government, as you know, and FEMA has really let them down, especially in North Carolina. It's a shame. Uh, they spent a lot of money on having illegal people come into our country. Migrants, you've heard about it. And uh, there wasn't a lot of money for the people of North Carolina or a lot of the people from a lot of other states that were also devastated by that monster. That was a monster storm. But uh, so many people have come together and done an incredible job, so many, including Franklin Graham, who has been amazing. To every family who has lost a loved one or a home, our hearts are with you, and we're praying for you. I mean, the homes are, homes are bad, but family members are really bad. That's a tough one. It's something you can never really — you can't shake that. But all I can do is say uh, we love you, and we're with you 100 percent. And on January 20th, if we are — if we win this election, I always like to say — I, I always like to say if, and people say, oh, please say when, but — you know, we have to we have to understand that bad things can happen, but we're not going to let it happen. We're never going to let it happen again. We're we're doing really well. We're leading. I know nobody in this room gambles, but some of the gambling polls are really in there, like 65 to 35 or something like that. I served one, and, but nobody here gambles. Does anybody in this room know? No, 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 no. Great Christians don't gamble, do they? Oh, no. <laughs> so so we're, we're doing really well, uh, I would say, beyond our wildest ex expectations. And that's not only in polls. Uh, more particularly, it's in uh, the votes that are being cast. They're coming in at levels that we've never seen. One of the things that's amazing is North Carolina so it was devastated, devastated. And yet, areas that were hap the worst, the worst areas, we just left one, as you know, and I met some of the greatest people, but they just set a record for votes cast thus far, and their homes are gone. I mean, it's, uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, thing. I figured maybe you'd get 50 percent, and these are, they call it Trump country, and I'm very honored by that. But these are Trump people. And just think of that. Their homes are gone. They've gone through such hell. And it's as big a, a water — you know, that's a, as big a water storm, they say, as we've ever seen in this country. And they just set a record. They compared it to the two, uh, the two elections previous. And uh, we have a substantial number more. Can you imagine that? I mean, those are great, great people. Thank you very much. 
I want to thank a very special man, Ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson, for organizing this event. And, of course, Candy, because without Candy, I don't know if Ben would be the same. I don't think so, actually. It's a special couple. But I, I can I tell him the one quick little story where you told me a couple of times. But, you know, Ben was very tough to beat, actually. He was getting up, 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 and uh, other people were falling in the wrong direction because he was in a primary with me, the original primary. And one day in a church, it was a Sunday morning, and he was doing well, really well. And in a church, he came over to me and he said, you know you're going to win, don't you? And I said, what's this all about? Because he's a tough competitor. I said, what is this all about? He said, God has picked you to win. Can you believe that? Right? And you have no idea he was so tough for him to say that. I said, this is really something. And he really was. He's uh, something. People love him. And they loved him then. And they even love him more now. And he went to HUD, which is a, I must say, it's always mired in scandal. People, you know, you're giving out a lot of money. And there's a lot of bad things happen when you're giving out all that money. And Ben went four years perfection. I've, it's, I don't know, has it ever happened before? Has it ever happened before? I wasn't surprised, but uh, a lot of people were surprised. Anytime you get through that one for four years, you have to be one honest, uh, one honest gentleman. But he ran it really great, and he's a special man, and he's done a special job today, and it's my honor to be here. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ben and Candy, very much. Appreciate it. That's some story, though, isn't it, Ben, huh? Candy. I love that story. I'd also like to thank somebody that's uh, done unbelievable things, and especially in very hard times. I've uh, seemed to, whenever I, w when I was president, and I would go to a lot of the sites, the tornadoes, the tornadoes are vicious. They, they ask which are the worst, are the tornadoes, the hurricanes, the tsunamis? And I have a friend, that's what he does, he studies this. I said, so what's the worst? He actually said, tsunami. The ocean just lifts up, and a lot of bad things happen, you know, in terms of the level. But they're all bad in their own way. But I've uh, been with Franklin Graham through a lot of them. And we're very happy to have helped him out during the course of most of them, and uh, maybe in particular this one. This was so sad to see such a great part of our country and uh, so devastating. When you looked at the size of that storm, that hurricane, it covered the whole state of Florida, practically. You know, normally you see a little trough th through it or hitting one area, but you'd look at the, the map and you look at the whole state of Florida was covered in one form or another. And uh, Franklin Graham just is a special, special person with a great family. And his father wasn't too bad either, right? You know, my father used to take me, like, to Yankee Stadium. He loved, uh, he loved Billy Graham, and he would take me, as a young guy, he would take me to Yankee Stadium. And he thought Billy Graham was great. And I'll tell you what, Billy Graham's looking down, and he's very proud of his son and his family. I can tell you that without doubt. <laughs> Pastor Paula White I've known for a long time, and she is so... Uh, Unbelievable what she's done for the campaign. She's just organized everything. Everybody respects her. She'll call meetings, and everybody shows up. Even if it's two hours later, they'll get here. And uh, she's just a very incredible woman. And what she's done with evangelicals, what she's done with actually people of all faiths, but uh, it's just uh, what, she, what she's done really has made a big difference. And we get 88 percent of the vote, and people would say, wow, that's not bad, 88 percent. And they said, how did you do that? And I said, uh, would you please speak to Paula White? <laughs> because she knew what she was doing. And uh, we have a team of pastors, ministers, and even rabbis where we are very uh, — they like what I've done for Israel, I can tell you that. We have a lot of rabbis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Where is Paula? Where is Paula? She was right behind me before. You know, she's probably working because she has. That's what she does. But, Paul, she's here someplace. She's right back there. She's making phone calls, getting more people lined up for the vote. I'd rather have her do that than be here. But that's the kind of person she is. She's fantastic. And Scott Turner, who was in the administration. Scott, where's Scott? Come on, Scott. This guy, a great person, a great everything, great athlete, and a very fine man. Uh, and you really did something very special for the administration. We really appreciate it. And get ready. Get ready. Just keep yourself in good shape. We don't have to worry about his shape, I can tell you that. But we appreciate it, Scott. Thank you very much. And a beautiful speaker. Boy, he got up and he would, he would talk to groups of people and they were so jazzed up they would, they could do anything. He was very special. And a, a person that's, uh, I have to say, the most special. We have to say this, Ben, the most special of them all, because he's my son. You know? I mean... You know, I'm saying... How can he be more special than Ben Carson? But, Ben, do you mind if I say he's my son? Am I allowed to say just slightly more special? Oh, you're tied. Let's call it a tie, okay? <laughs> but Eric has been uh, amazing in, uh, in business, and everything he's done has been so incredible. He has become a legend in the legal profession because he's the most subpoenaed human being in history. <laughs> He's gotten more subpoenas than any human being in history. Every day, Congress, and this one, and that one, deranged Jack Smith. We had people, the likes of which nobody — you talk about weaponization of government. What they've done is incredible. And he's cool as a cucumber. Yeah, Dad, uh, we got another couple of subpoenas today. Where they come from? Congress, this one, that one. And uh, crazy Nancy Pelosi would send them like it's cookies. She had subpoenas on the corner of her desk, and congressmen would just walk in and grab a subpoena, write it, and send it. And I'd say, here, Eric Handle it. He became very proficient. He's, uh, he's a great young man, and he's, uh, he really is very excited about today. Did he do a good job when he spoke? Huh? No, he's great. He's, great. He's uh, got a lot of talent, a lot of talent. And also here is my daughter Tiffany and her husband Michael. And Tiffany is pregnant. She's going to have a baby. She's going to have a baby, and it's going to be a — I'm not allowed to say what the baby is going to be. Am I? Am I? I don't know. I'm not going to put her in the spot. I'm not going to say it. I'm not taking it, Jess. I don't want to see her have a long face. Dad, you shouldn't have said that, Dad. But she, they, she's been, uh, from day one, she was a great student. And uh, she went to a fantastic law school, graduated number one in her class. Right? And uh, we couldn't be happier. I mean, it's uh, just never had a problem with her. I shouldn't say, we better knock on wood. Where's some wood around here? Oh. That's a one piece of wood. Most of it's plastic. <laughs> but she has been. She's been an amazing person. And her husband's doing a great job. And thank you, Michael, for the job you're doing. Appreciate it. Congrat congratulations, so. And Linda McMahon, who's, uh, who most of you no, she headed up small business for the government. Now, small business is giant business. When you add it all up, it's about as big as any. I think it's probably bigger than any bank in the world. And she was one of our great, our great people in the administration and a very, very successful woman. Uh, she was very generous. I know with Franklin and with the work done here, she was really very generous. And she's always generous. She's been generous to the campaign, but we're very proud of her. Linda, wherever you may be, where are you, Linda? 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 Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Incredible, an incredible woman. And a friend of mine also, Steve Whitcoff, who's a very successful man. 
And he is uh, — where is Whitcoff? He is somebody that's been also very — he wrote a big check for Franklin to take care of a place called North Carolina. And so we like him. Even if we didn't like him, we like him, right? Steve Whitcoff. Thank you, Steve, very much. And Peter Navarro, I heard he gave a great speech. And Peter's — Peter took a lot of abuse. He talked about weaponization. And do I see my favorite person here? Will you please stand up? What's this all about? Stand up. Wow. Thank you, darling. Right from the beginning, right? Right from the beginning, from day one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elvira. Appreciate it. And thank you to every pastor, patriot, and faith leader here today. We have so many, so many people. I'm, I'm, you know, this is the worst, is when you, when you introduce some, you're in trouble. Because I'm seeing six, seven people. I get a lot of people. Then I see a group of two over there. I'm in trouble, but let's get on with it. Do you mind? Let's get on. Because with your help, we're going to make America great again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. So I was introduced to church at a very early age, and I had a wonderful church, actually, in Jamaica, Queens, First Presbyterian Church. I don't know if you know it. It's, uh, it was built a long time ago, and it was great. But very early, and then ultimately on Sundays, my parents, Fred and Mary, would drive me into Manhattan to worship at Marble Collegiate Church, where Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the author of the — one of the really big bestsellers, The Power of Positive Thinking, he was the head pastor, great book. It was a great book then and a great book now, Power of Positive Thinking. A lot of people could use a little positive thinking, right? <laughs> And he was an incredible speaker. Uh, my sister and I were both married there, and the funeral services for both of my parents. I mean, my mom and dad were — they took place in the main sanctuary of Marble Collegiate Church, and it was just always very special. I still remember the great sermons of Norman Vincent Peale. And he truly was one of the greatest speakers I've ever — first, he was a believer, but he was also a great speaker, an unbelievable man. I actually saw his last sermon, but uh, when you left church, you were really disappointed that it was over. I mean, I can't — I have to say, we have, I know we have a lot of pastors and ministers, but sometimes it's like <laughs> — am I allowed to say that? It's like a, like a Biden, you know? <laughs> sometimes. Not often, of course. But this man — and, you know, he always preached in sort of modern times, a little bit in modern times. He'd bring it up. I remember — I remember so many of his sermons, but he talked about Alfred Sloan, who was the founder of General Motors, and how he grew up and how he had tremendous problems with alcohol. And he became a major alcoholic. And then, you know, Norman Vincent Peale would just say, and then one day he — met God, and he was just the expression of this man. He used to stand at a podium, and he'd always he'd be like this, just like that. And, it, and he'd preach. And you really were. You know, you were disappointed when it was over. He'd tell you stories about God, about many things, about life. It was really stories about life and how it pertained to religion. And it was really amazing, and he was amazing. And a brilliant — just uh, the — the uh, enthusiasm he had. And I listened to him for, I would say, 20 years. And then one day, I went to church, Marble Collegiate, and he was now, I guess, in his 90s. And he was preaching, and you could see he was getting a little bit tired, and he stood — just like I said, right over here to the left of the podium. And he said, I can't do this anymore. That was it. 
And he just sat down. It was — I mean, we all understood. He was just uh, — he was really — no, I mean, he was really uh, — it was the last — his last uh, time at the — at — at the podium and uh, the last time he preached. And it was an amazing moment, and everybody just stood up and applauded. It was — it was sort of a beautiful thing to watch, actually. But uh, to see him, because he was truly a very — a very big name at the time and very respected. And the fact that he wrote this book that was such a big bestseller, it was a massive bestseller, still is, I think. But as I look back at my life's journey and events, I now recognize that it's been the hand of God leading me to where I am today. Thank you. And my faith took on new meaning on July 13th in Butler, Pennsylvania, where I was uh, knocked to the ground, essentially, by what seemed like a uh, supernatural hand. And I would like to think that God saved me for a purpose, and that's to make our country greater than ever before. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is uh, something. You know, Eric is a great shooter. Great. If he were a golfer, he'd be like a plus four. He's a great shooter. And so is Don. They're both great shooters. They know a lot about guns. In fact, I think I got the blessing of the NRA because of my sons early on. I remember I was running against a lot of people that had good gun credentials and uh, 2016 and the NRA, which was, you know, in its full bloom, actually. Uh, they even spent $35 million of the campaign. But I think they did it because of my sons, because I beat out a lot of very good people that believed in uh, that whole world, a little different world, but that whole world. And because of Don and Eric, but when they both heard uh, what had happened that day at Butler, they said, how far was it? And they said it was 130 yards, and they knew the weapon. And they said, I can't believe it, because Eric actually said, a bad shooter would hit you every single time. And I didn't realize it to that extent. I made that right-hand turn, and I made it a little quickly, and that got me in a position where it just whew, uh, not a good feeling, but much better than the alternative. <laughs> Wasn't the best feeling. And it was a it was a bloody sucker, I will tell you that. I didn't realize, but the doctor told me, we told me a couple of things. He said, you're the luckiest man I've ever seen. He said, I've been doing this for 25 years. And he said, sir, I'd like to suggest that you go out right now and buy a lottery ticket, because this is a good day. But Eric told me and Don told me that, you know, that uh, I think they became more religious that day because uh, they uh, really — they said that was amazing that uh, we could have survived something like that, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch away. So it's uh, pretty amazing. And, and if we didn't make — thank you. And if we didn't make — thank you very much. If we didn't make the turn, uh, that wouldn't have happened. And — I made the turn to show a chart, which became my all-time favorite chart in the history of the world. Right? My all-time favorite. I sleep with that chart. I kiss that chart. But we're 15 days away from the most important election in the history of our country. And if you want to know what is at stake for Christians in this race, just listen to what Kamala Harris had to say last week, because when two college students, religious college students, and very good people, everybody said what wonderful young men they were and are. At a campaign stop, she heard 
shouting from the background, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And Kamala Harris ridiculed them, mocked them, and told them they were, quote, you're at the wrong rally. Get that. She basically said, get out, but I won't say that because people didn't hear that so much. But she said, you're at the wrong rally. And that's really what she meant. That's really what she meant. She's very destructive to religion. She's very destructive to Christianity and very destructive to evangelicals and to the Catholic Church. And uh, she's, uh, she is, is, let me put it this way, Ben, she is your worst nightmare. Much worse, much worse than Biden. And he wasn't so hot. (laughs) But while Kamala says that people who believe in Jesus don't belong to her rallies, you have to remember that. That's as loud as it can be. In fact, a lot of people said that would be disqualifying for her. That would be a disqualification. In our movement, we love Christians, we welcome believers, and we embrace followers of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Boy, this is a lively group, Ben. This is a very lively group you've assembled. What's going on with Ben? This is something, Ben. But at Trump rallies, we don't tell Christians to get lost. We tell Christians to get out and vote. You don't have the choice of sitting out this election because if Kamala Harris gets four more years, the radical left is not going to leave Christians alone. It's going to get worse and worse, and you're going to suffer greatly. They will come after Christians all over the country. Kamala Harris has vowed to abolish the filibuster, letting her pack the Supreme Court. And I even heard as many as 25 justices. The Supreme Court with... Marxist radicals with people that we don't want on the Supreme Court to rewrite the Constitution and to overrule your values. I think one of the greatest things I've done is the Supreme Court and also getting over 300 judges appointed throughout our land that have made a tremendous difference. Those 300 judges have made a tremendous difference. She'll flood our country with tens of millions more illegal aliens and make them all citizens, canceling out your voting power forever. Kamala will mandate that every public school in America must promote the idea that children can change their genders, allow men into girls' locker room, and also allow men to play in women's sports. Can you imagine that? Men and women's sports. And it's such a strong movement by, I believe, really a very, very small group of people. Because, you know, it's interesting. I haven't met one person that thinks that's a good idea. And yet it's like a movement. But I've never met anybody. Now, I don't know everybody. But I haven't met anybody that wants it. And even the young ladies that are afraid of what's happening. You saw the other day the volleyball player who was hit very hard on the head by a ball, a smash that, uh, in fact, I saw this person, a person who transitioned, hit the ball. I mean, that ball was moving as fast as a ball can move. And she said, I've never seen anything like it. Really whacked her. But some people were put out of commission just in volleyball, let alone other sports. But when you look, look at weightlifting, how about that one? Or you look at swimming records, track records, it's just... It's so demeaning to women. It's so ridiculous. It's so demeaning. But Kamala will force doctors and parents to allow sex changes and genital mutilation of minor children. That's what they do. She has it literally where 
sex change operations for people in detention. When they were being held in detention, if they wanted a sex change operation, she said, yes, I approve it. I mean, who would do this? Who would do this? And you know, I'm talking about everything else, but I'm also talking it's an extremely um, difficult operation and a very expensive operation. Uh, but who would who would do this and who would want this? And between that, she, she was the head of the movement, defund the police. You have to understand, she's a radical left Marxist. And a lot of people want to know, what does that mean? She's a person so far left, like nobody's seen in the Senate in many, many years. But the main thing is, she's not a very bright person either. That's a dangerous, that's a really dangerous combination. Your religious liberty will be gone. Your free speech will be gone. Your Second Amendment will be gone. And parental rights will be gone forever. So I'm here tonight to deliver a simple message to Christians across America. It's time to stand up and save your country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. On November 5th, Christian voters need to turn out in the largest numbers ever. Do you know that if you did that, because you have a reputation of not voting proportionately like you should, you do know that. I think that maybe is a form of rebellion. Could that be possible? <laughs> you know the two groups? Not to equate them, but uh, they are probably associated in some form. But Christians, evangelicals, but Christians and gun owners. Gun owners don't vote. They vote, but very small proportions. If they did, or if Christians did, nobody could ever beat us. Nobody. So I hope that we're going to get numbers like we haven't seen. You remember, this is your last day. Today is your last day of registration. You have to remember that. And so... If you want to leave right now, go and leave. I won't be insulted. <laughs> leave right now and go and register. But this is your last day. So we need to tell Kamala Harris that we've had enough. Kamala, you've been the worst vice president. You're, you're a member of the worst administration in the history of our country. The happiest person around is Jimmy Carter because Jimmy Carter is considered a brilliant president by comparison to crooked Joe Biden. Jimmy Carter is brilliant. It's, his administration will go down as a brilliant administration compared to crooked Joe. But we're going to say, Kamala, you've done a horrible job. You're a horrible vice president. There's no way you're going to be our president. Kamala, you're fired. Get out, 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 out. For four straight years, I fought for Christians like no president has ever fought before. You know that. I protected the religious freedom of doctors, nurses, teachers, and faith groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor. Oh, I fought for them. I blocked, I blocked the IRS. They were coming after everybody. They still are, I guess, to an extent. But now they are because of this administration. But I blocked the IRS from using the Johnson Amendment to interfere with pastors' freedom of speech. I mean, we want to hear from our pastors. We don't want them to be shy. Where they take away your tax-exempt status because a pastor mentioned something that's slightly political, and I ended it. Kamala Harris has taken it away, and... We're not, I'll tell you what, if you, if you take it, if she has taken your right away. I gave that to you and they took it back, but we're going to give it back to you within the first week. I'd like to make it the first day, but it'll take me a little while. So we're going to give it back to you within the first week. You're going to have that right because we want to hear from these people. There aren't too many people I want to hear from, but you I do want to hear from. So 
We're going to give you back within the first week, and Paula will make sure that uh, that takes place. I will not disappoint you. I appointed 300 judges to interpret the law and the Constitution as written and withstood the vicious attacks to confirm three great Supreme Court justices, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. They're great. And they're courageous. They're courageous and they're brilliant, but they are courageous. What they have to endure with the radical left and uh, all of the things that they have to listen to, I actually think it's illegal what people do. They call it playing the ref. You know, playing the ref? They'll say horrible things, hoping that the three, but also judges, they play the ref with judges. They, the great Bobby Knight basketball, he used to scream at the referee. He would scream like nobody ever screamed before. Indiana, he was a great guy. He backed me early on. He said, you're going to win. I said, well, I don't know, Bobby. He said, you're going to win. I have no doubt. He said, I want this guy named Trump to run for president. I didn't know him. I called him up to thank him. He said, you're going to win. All you have to do is say it. You got to run. And he was a tough cookie. Just died recently. But he had the last undefeated team in college basketball. He won two or three national championships. He was a great coach. And he never had the great oh, — he had a couple, I guess, great players. But he never had that real player that some teams have. He just did it with team. But he would scream at the referees. They call it playing the ref. And they'd say, Bobby, Bobby, you got to stop, Bobby. Don't do it. You're not going to win this call. You're not going to win it. It's over. He said, no, but I'm going to win the next call. <laughs> and it's true. They'd, have a, they'd knock the hell out of somebody, and the referee was afraid to call it. It's true. <laughs> he was the master. But they do that. They play the ref. They start screaming about the judge is no good, and this one's no good, and they're slow, and they're lousy judges, and the judge should be impeached, and all of this crap when you have a brilliant judge that's doing the right thing. And they get, uh, and some people will fold a little bit. They'll say, hey, I'll get them off my back. Let me just give a bad ruling here or there. And some will do that, actually. But uh, fortunately, most have courage, and they understand. I, I really believe it's illegal what they do, and I know there's some great lawyers in the room. You ought to look at it, because what they do is so obvious. What they've done to the Supreme Court, even with the protection of their houses, you're not supposed to be allowed to march in front. They didn't stop it. You're not allowed to do any of these things that are happening. But they're, they're playing the ref, and they're playing it with judges and justices, and they shouldn't be allowed to do it, and I believe it's illegal. I issued guidance making clear that the right to freedom of worship does not end at the door to a public school. We took care of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I stood proudly with our friend and ally, the State of Israel. I kept my promise, recognized Israel's eternal capital, and opened the American Embassy in Jerusalem, and actually got it built. I actually got it built. But uh, many presidents, uh, many, many presidents before me said they campaigned on doing that, and then they didn't do it. And I understand why, because when I got into office, I was called by people, heads of state, highest level, I was called by kings and prime ministers. I was called by everybody, don't do it, don't do it. And then they heard I was going to do it. And they all called me, and I said, just do me a favor. I shouldn't say this because it's a little white, a little white, uh, would you call it? Yeah, I wasn't available. I said, just tell them I won't be available, but I'll call. This, I think, was a Thursday. I said, I'll call you back on Monday to kings, to the biggest people from the biggest countries, most powerful countries. And I said, I'll call you back. And then on Thursday, I announced it. I said, uh, we are going to do exactly what a lot of people didn't want me to do. They said there'd be bloodshed and everything else all over. There was none. And I did something that no other president had the courage to do. And then on Monday, I called them back. Hi. <laughs> How have you been? Oh, I tried getting you. I wasn't able to, but you've already done it. So we made Jerusalem the capital, and that, that brought a lot of
Did you know that? That was something I didn't know. So, but I understood why other presidents were — I mean, every single person that campaigned for decades and decades, every president said they were going to do it. None of them did it. I did. I also recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights was a big deal. The Golan Heights — that's another thing. 72 years, people would come in and leave, come in and leave. They'd meet every year, every two years, about the Golan Heights. And I spoke with David Friedman. I said, give me a lesson in five minutes or less on the Golan Heights. And he did. Talked about how important it was strategically. And before all of the modern equipment and radar and all of that that we have now, but it was unbelievably important from a military because it was the highest point in the Middle East. And uh, — I did that, and nobody even asked for that because they thought that would be a bridge too far. But I did that for Israel. And I was the first and only president to convene a meeting at the United Nations to end religious persecution worldwide. <laughs> Nobody's done what I've done in terms of religion, in terms of Christianity, but in terms of religion, nobody's done what I did. We did all of this and much more in four short years, and I will keep on fighting for our cherished American values when we become the 47th President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Under Kamala Harris, you've seen the Department of Justice target parents at school board meetings. Have you ever seen anything like it? They're like the enemy. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. These great people, they just want their children to be treated reasonably well. And the FBI would send spies into Catholic churches if — I don't know how many Catholics are here. But if you're Catholic, there is no way you can be voting for these people. These people are a nightmare. I don't know what they have against Catholics, but Catholics are treated worse than anybody. So uh, — and by the way, evangelicals are next. You can bet on it. Evangelicals are next. But they label Catholics as potential domestic terrorists. And the fact is that uh, they'll be coming after you soon. These people are sick. These people are very sick people. Christians will not be safe with Kamala Harris as President of the United States. It's not even thinkable. She's going to deal with President Xi of China. I don't think so. I know him very well. He's a very fierce man. Putin, all of these people, I know them all very well. And we'll end up in Third World War because they have no idea. They have no idea. We're not going to have a Third World War. But if they get in, I think that we will have a Third World War out of stupidity, out of absolute stupidity. Think of it. Putin would have never, ever attacked Ukraine if I were president. All of those people that are now dead would not be dead. All of those cities that are knocked to the ground with those magnificent domed towers that are laying on the side shattered into a million pieces. All of that would be up right now. You take a look at those cities. They've been bombed. They've been — there's nothing standing. There's literally not a building standing in many of them. As soon as I take the oath of office, I will stop Kamala Harris' yes. weaponization of law enforcement against yes. Americans yes. of faith. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And, you know, I'm just — did you ever notice — so it's Kamala Harris. Nobody knows who the hell Harris is, right? Do you ever say, and we're going to stop Harris? They all go, who's Harris? It's a weird thing. You'd think your name would be — but isn't it true? Nobody knows who Harris is, so we'll call her Kamala. It's a weird thing. Lots of strange things take place in politics, don't they? But I will create a new federal task force on fighting anti-Christian bias. That'll be done immediately. And I think it's very important for the people in this room to know, like, 
Dr. Ben Carson knows Americans of faith are not a threat to our country. Americans of faith are the soul of our country, right? I will once again appoint rock-solid pro-constitutional judges to faithfully interpret the law and the Constitution. You know, the 300 judges that we appointed changed the whole — I mean, it was so bad. It was so bad what was happening out there. And these are — these are great people, and they're fair people, and they do the right thing. We believe in the First Amendment rights of freedom of worship and freedom of speech. And I will deliver universal school choice, empowering every parent to send their child to the public, private charter, or religious school that is right for them. And I will allow homeschool parents to spend $10,000 a year tax-free on costs associated with their children's education. Under the Trump administration, we will return patriotic education to our schools. That's okay. That's a good thing. Kamala Harris supports the 1619 Project. Think of that. She supports it strongly, that teaches children to hate their country. That's what it does. The 1619 Project was condemned by every historian, and yet, Kamala Harris's administration tried to push it into schools all across America. She fought very hard for that. She also fought very hard for the people that burned down Minneapolis, that were literally at war in Minnesota with one of the worst governors. I cannot believe this guy's a governor. Can you imagine him as a president? He is a wackadoo. And by the way, how good did J.D. Vance do in exposing him? They lie about everything. You know, they were going today, every single thing, like uh, every single thing, they say it's the opposite. Project 2025. Trump loves it. He loves it. He loves it. They just say it. And I've totally disavowed it. I a group of people went in. I don't know what they did. I said specifically, I will. I refuse to read it. But every time they get up, they say everything that I've disavowed. They go on again and again and again. And the radical left people that are listening to them just let them talk. And they know it's all a big lie, but they just lie. I've never seen anything like it. You know, I've had some uh, political opponents before. I've never seen — even Crooked Hillary didn't lie like these people, and she lied a lot. <laughs> but these people are going — I actually think they're choking, because I watch today every single thing that I've said, no, 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 they say, he said, yes, 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 like point after point. And, uh, no, there's something going on in their heads. Perhaps it's Trump derangement syndrome. It's horrible. Or perhaps they know they're losing because we're doing very well. They know they know how well we're doing. Even the fake news, and that's a lot of fake news back there, Ben. The fake news knows the fake news knows how well we're doing. Isn't it sad that we have to rely on the gambling — the gambling — the gamblers are the ones that are the only ones that want to say it. They're the ones. Sixty-five percent? No, no, they know. But we're going to just let it wait. And I really think we're going to have maybe one of the greatest victories in the history of our country. The history of our country. On day one, I will sign an executive order banning schools from promoting critical race theory or transgender insanity. I will take historic action to defeat the toxic poison of gender ideology and reaffirm that God created two genders, male and female. 
I will keep men out of women's sports. I will sign a law banning child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. Won't happen anymore. And we will proudly say Merry Christmas again. On day one, I will stop the migrant invasion. We will begin the largest deportation operation in the history of our country. I will end inflation, and we will make America affordable again. We will quickly become energy independent again. You know, we were energy independent just four years ago. And we will frack, 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 and drill, baby, drill. And I will cut energy prices in half within 12 months from January 20th, the day you assume the office of president. We will have, because we have more liquid gold under our feet than any other country, including Russia and including Saudi Arabia. We were third and maybe even fourth when I got in there. When I left, we were number one in energy production. And uh, we did things that were amazing. We would have right now been four times higher than we were. We would have been making money, paying down debt. We would have been in a position that you wouldn't believe, but they decided to do it a different way. It's terrible. Wind. They put wind all over the place. Wind. Kills, kills your birds, and if you want to watch television and the wind isn't blowing, you can forget it. <laughs> Darling, let's watch the president tonight. I'm sorry, Esther, but the wind isn't blowing. We won't be able to watch. <laughs> it's not exactly the most reliable source, but it is something. It's the most expensive source by far. I will end the war in Ukraine, stop the chaos in the Middle East, and prevent World War III. I will crush violent crime and give our police the support, protection, resources, and respect they so dearly deserve. We will rebuild our cities, including our capital in Washington, D.C., making them safe, clean, and beautiful again. And we will secure our elections. Everyone will prosper. Every family will thrive. And every day we will be filled with opportunity and hope we will again have the American dream for our children. But for that to happen, we must defeat Kamala Harris and stop her radical left agenda. We have to stop it once and for all. We want a landslide that is too big to rig. Too big to rig. Early voting is underway, so you know what you have to do. So Christians, Get everyone you know and vote. You have to vote, or we're not going to have the life that we should have, a life of prosperity and hope, a life of beauty. We're not going to have it. We're going to be fighting for our lives. These people have — they mean serious business. They've, they've — I honestly believe, in many cases, they're sick, and we cannot let this happen because it was — our religion that kept our country together for many years. It was our religion that kept it together. And they're trying to take that away, and they're trying to destroy our country. After all, we have been through together. We stand on the verge of the four greatest years of the history of our country. With your help from now until Election Day, we will redeem America's promise. We will put America first, and we will take back the nation that we love. November 5th will be the most important day in the history of our country, and together we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America healthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you very much. God bless you all.
God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.